Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome everyone to this evening's lecture. As you know, on the long-term impact of Donald Trump on American democracy. Now, I will in a second say more about our distinguished speaker. But before we begin, if everyone could, you know, notice that we're recording this event. So don't say anything you don't want to be on record. <laughs> But also, if everyone could first just make sure to put your mobile phones on silent or vibrate, that will obviously help the discussion and the recording. Now, the topic this evening is something that pretty much everyone in the world already has a view on now. And indeed, quite a few people in varied political circles have gotten to a point where anything having to do with this particular U.S. presidential candidate, they can only think glib humorous thoughts or indescribably sad ones. But many others, scholars, thinkers, are asking hard questions of this unfolding sequence of events and drawing thoughtful lessons from it, and also from related incidents occurring around the world. We all need to do that. Now, this evening, the Lee Kuan Yew School is privileged and delighted to have with us one of the most thoughtful and accomplished of political science scholars on democracy, on methodology, to reflect on this topic, Professor Ian Shapiro, Sterling Professor of Political Science at Yale University. Now, very quickly, I won't repeat up here Professor Shapiro's very impressive biography of a compliment. That bio everyone can read from the paper that you've got in front of you. I just wanted to say some things that might not be known to everyone. That Ian here is Sterling Professor of Political Science at Yale University means he is one of a very select handful of the highest ranking professors at Yale. Ian is elevated in a way that cuts across many disciplines of study at that university. A Sterling Professor at Yale is the counterpart of university professors at Harvard or institute professors at MIT or region professors in leading U.S. public universities. And while there can be many professors, only a very limited number are honored in the way that Ian has been. Professor Shapiro is one of a very few scholars whose deep accomplishments and research bear a standard and carry an intellectual weight so that they are known and recognized outside the confines of their discipline. Beyond all this, Professor Shapiro is a very sharp critic of economists and others who believe in a rational choice approach to political science work. And I say this to very quickly follow up by saying that he is extremely hard on other scholars who have come upon a specific methodology and seek to apply it everywhere. In other words, people who carry a hammer and then see the world as just a bunch of nails. Thankfully, this evening, it is not us like that who are in his scrutiny, but instead Donald Trump and the state of the American polity. <laughs> Ian will speak to us for about 40 minutes leaving plenty of time afterwards for questions. But if you could now join me in welcoming Ian back to the school and inviting him to share with us his ideas on Trump and the state of American democracy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I know in, at Yale in New Haven, if we held a talk of this kind uh, on a Friday evening, we would get a good turnout. So it's a, it's a tribute to you that you're willing to do that. Um, so the, um, Kishore asked me to talk about the long-term impact of Trump uh, on American politics, which is you know, something of a moving target, trying to figure out uh, where, where, where things are going to end up. And so uh, I didn't want to engage in um, frivolous speculation. And I also don't want to tell you about things you're reading in the newspaper every day, because um, it doesn't seem like a good use of, of 
any of our time. So I thought that what I should really do is to try and address the question of what is lo the long-term impact of Trump going to be on American politics, that really the thing to do is to focus on what has given rise to Trump, the Trump phenomenon, um, and then think about whether the forces that have given rise to the Trump phenomenon, how they're going to play themselves out. So that's what I'm going to start with, and then I'm going to come back to the likely implications of this uh, and it give you my two cents worth of what I think they're going to be. Um, so if you think about what is it that gave rise to the Trump phenomenon, um, there are two classes of causes that people generally point to. The first is economic and it's uh, the sort of um, hollowing out of the, of the white particularly white male electorate. And the second that's much less talked about has to do with party selection rules, rules for picking leaders of political parties. Um, so because the, that's much less attended to, um, I'm going to spend more time on the second one on the, than on the first. But let me, let me start out. When we talk about the sort of economic malaise, that has given rise to populist politics in the U.S., which is, of course, not just Trump, the Trump phenomenon, but the Sanders phenomenon um, in the Democratic Party, which has a lot of overlap, even though uh, obviously it's, it's got a different ideological hue, but it's, for instance, anti-free um, anti trade uh, on both sides, um, Quite, quite strong anti-immigrant sentiments on both uh, among some Sanders supporters as well as Trump supporters. Um, people generally point to three things. Um, one is uh, technological innovation, which has um, made a lot of uh, occupations obsolete. Um, the second is um, trade, globalization, the, the shipping of jobs offshore. Um, and the third is the other factors that have produced the relentless growth of inequality, mostly associated with Piketty's work in recent times, the argument that returns to capital ex uh, outpace returns to other factors of production, which means the rich keep get richer at a faster clip than anybody else. And so you get more and more inequality at the top, which produces resentment uh, lower down. And this used to be mostly, the, particularly the technology and trade, used to be uh, mostly a blue collar ph phenomenon, textile jobs, industrial jobs, and so on, going to first to Mexico, then to Malaysia, uh, Indonesia, uh, etc. But increasingly, it's also the hollowing out of the middle class, so, traditional occupations um, um, and all everything associated with financial services. You know, 30, 35 years ago when somebody wanted a mortgage, they would go down to the, to the local bank and they would be interviewed by a manager who was a person of some status in the community um, and quite well paid and the bank manager would size them up and interview them and decide whether they were wor worthy of a mortgage and, and there was a, a relationship. Today, you know, they'll do it over the phone to somebody earning $26,000 a year who types their application into a software program, maybe in, uh, that's not even in the U.S. So that bank manager's job has gone. Uh, so it's not just, when we think about offshoring of employment, up well into the middle classes. So the conventional story is a combination of these three things, the, the elimination of jobs through technology, the offshoring of employment in, in, in for larger and larger numbers, and then the other logics of capitalism that, that produce these, the super wealthy at the top, which breeds incredible resentment, have combined to create this, this angry class of people who um, are downwardly mobile, or, or if, their in, if their lifestyles and incomes have remained stagnant, it's only been, they've only achieved that from a single family to a two-earner family. Um, so they essentially have two wages to produce 
what one wage produced before. And they are under, in, in great financial distress. And, and the symptoms of it are everywhere. A college education exceeds the, the, the tuition for an elite education exceeds the median income in the country for, for a year. And so when they see the children of the, the investment bankers going off to elite schools that uh, they can't aspire to send their own kids to, it's not surprising that you get this virulent anger. And it's full of irrationalism, of course, that um, um, the people they want to kick out of the country are not actually the people who are taking their jobs. <laughs> Um, and all that, you know, but you, so we could spend a lot of time disaggregating the, the, the bits and pieces of what, what it is they believe, and, and it doesn't add up to any very coherent set of propositions, which is one reason why, why the absence of a coherent set of proposals on the part of Trump doesn't bother them, because uh, the, it's, he's appealing more to kind of incohate rage. So that, that's the, the economic story. The, the pop analyses are full of it. And one thing is for sure, if we say what the impact of Trump is going to be, that whether Trump wins or whether Trump loses, that phenomenon's not going away. Um, you know, and if, if Hillary Clinton is to win, uh, she's going to have to, if she doesn't address those uh, issues or, or find some way to get those issues addressed in a, in a serious way, she will for sure be a one-term president. So uh, in that sense, the, the, you know, it won't be Trump then, it'll, but it'll be some other populist figure. And I'll have something to say about that a, a little later. So, but that, that's the sort of economic story. I'm sure it's to most people in this room. And it's what you can read in the Financial Times or The Economist or The Wall Street Journal. The, the other side of it that I think in some ways is more uh, interesting, at le uh, not least because it's much less talked about, and I'm going to spend the most of my time focusing on it, has to do with the way political parties operate. And particularly how the selection of leaders works, because I think it reflects something about the dynamic, not only of, of U.S. politics, but politics in many of the advanced countries that sort of interacts with these economic dynamics that we've just been talking about. Um, so uh, what, I, what I have in mind here is um, comes under the broad heading of the, the decentralization of control of political parties. Um, motivated by the idea of what I'm going to suggest is a rather misguided idea of, of democratic particip participation. Um, and it actually doesn't start in the Republican Party at all. It starts in the Democratic Party, and it really goes back to 1968. 1968, the Chicago Democratic Convention is a train wreck. Um, the riots in the streets. This is when the students are, are, are rioting uh, about Viet, the Vietnam War. Uh, Lyndon Johnson, who had won in the landslide four years earlier, was so unpopular he couldn't even run for re-election. Hubert Humphrey was running against Nixon, um, and there's you know there's blood in the streets in Chicago, and uh, it's a disaster for the Democrats. And there's a lot of hand wringing about that. And the question is what to do about it. And something gets created called the McGovern-Fraser Commission, um, run by, uh, I'm embarrassed to say, a political scientist, because I think it didn't come up with very good recommendations. But uh, it was run by a political scientist, even though it was called the McGovern-Fraser Commission, by Aust named Austin Ranney. And it came up with two important recommendations that were both highly consequential. Uh, but the, the basic diagnosis was, you know, the, the complaint of the rioting students was, this party is run in smoke-filled rooms uh, behind the scenes, and there's no, there's no participation in the cho choosing of who's going to be our leaders, and it's got to change. And the two, the two recommendations of the McGovern 
Commission. One was the beginning of the introduction of quotas. This is the early days of multiculturalism. Make sure the representation of women, minorities, and so on is much increased in the selection processes of uh, the party. Uh, but the other one, which I think matters much more for what we're talking about today, was that they, wa they wanted to get rid of the, the, the secret decisions in the smoke-filled rooms, and they wanted the introduction of primaries. Now, there had been primaries quite widely used in the progressive era, but they had pretty much died out in uh, the U.S. Um, and so the, the McGovern-Fraser Commission uh, pushed hard for the introduction, no, not only of primaries, but also caucuses, which are uh, groups of, of um, party members who meet and have more, something more, you know, all day session to pick uh, a candidate. And so uh, there was a, a great d uh, shifting of power in the choosing of candidates away, away from the hi uh, hierarchies of the party and to the memberships of the party. Um, and uh, the Republicans pretty much followed suit. So the, with something of a time lag, but the Republican Party also, uh, consists, uh, partly to preempt the kinds of pressures that had come to the fore in the Democratic Party, but also responding to similar criticisms of their own, basically moved in the direction of decentralization of candidate selection. And so you got to a point where uh, today, in both parties, uh, this has become uh, hugely important. And, and basically, you have to be able to win the primaries and caucuses in order to become the candidate. Whereas, you know, if you go back to the 1960 election, uh, many of the candidates Oh, 1964. They didn't enter primaries. Uh, even when there were primaries, they weren't binding on the on the decision makers. They were just supposed to be a sort of an indication uh, of of support. Uh, Lyndon Johnson uh, didn't participate in any of the primaries in the 1960 when he was thinking about running, uh, and nobody thought that was fatal to his chances. Although he ended up running, and Kennedy did instead. Um, Okay, so we have this phenomenon. What to say about it? Well, there are a lot, there's several problems with it. One is that primaries and caucuses tend to be dominated by activists who have intense preferences, and they're not the preferences of the median voter. So if you think about a sort of the basic, what we call the Downsian story of elections, uh, you know, if we have a, we have a normal distribution of voters and we have the left here and the right here, the median voter is somewhere there. And the idea is uh, if, a, if parties are going to be uh, representative, they're going to they're gonna be keep competing for the median voter. But of course, if you think about running a primary election, you've got a normal a distribution of, of Republicans and a distribution uh, here you've got a, uh, this would be the median Republican voter and this would be the median Democratic voter. The, the people who tend to go and participate in primaries and caucuses are these people. So um, the, the people who vote, the, you have low turnout, and it's mostly the, the intense activists at the extremes of the parties who participate in, in these systems of local control. So it's not even the case that the primaries produce the median voter in the Democratic Party and the median voter in the, Dem in the Republican Party. You know, in fact, they, they will produce, the, the tendency would be for them to produce somebody out here as the winner of the, of the, um, of the, f the first selection process. And that has a number of implications as it starts to play itself out over time. One is, um, you know, we think com competition is the lifeblood of democracy, Schumpeter and all that, and I, I'm, a, I'm a sort of Schumpeterian all the way down. Uh, but there's a big difference between 
centralized competition and decentralized competition. Um, there's, a big, there's a big difference between inter-party competition and intra-party competition. And if you, if you think about the old Schumpeterian story, what he thought was good for democracy, and which I agree, I, as I say, I'm a Schumpeterian on this point, is what you, what you really want to have happen is um, competition over what ideas, what policies are actually going to end up being chosen and governing, right? So you want inter-party competition, and each, you have a slightly to the center of left party competing with the center of right party on a national program, uh, and so, you know, it'll, they'll alternate in power over time, and that's what uh, they keep one another honest, and that kind of competition, it generates information and ideas and, and all the things that are supposed to be the good features of Schumpeterian competition. Intra-party competition is very different. First of all, it tends to produce clientelism, um, because the way that you get support is to give uh, a, a, very, a very local uh, constituency, the things that they want. Um, this is why uh, PR tends to because you get intra-party competition out of PR. But in single-member district systems, once you have primaries, you're also going to get clientelism. It's just PR, you get wholesale clientelism. In single-member district systems with primaries, you get retail clientelism. You get bridges to nowhere. You get all, all the sorts of things that uh, people are going to demand uh, of their representative as a basis for supporting them. So that's, that's one set of problems that you get. But another thing you're obviously going to get is polarization in the legislature. So everybody's, you know, be writing about why is there so much polarization in American politics? And one of the observations in the empirical literature is that um, Actually, the population is no less polarized, and no more polarized than it, it was 40 years ago. Uh, this turns out not to be quite true anymore. It's somewhat more polarized, the population. But this, the increased polarization of the population is mostly to do with blue state, red state sorting. So Republicans have tended to move into Republican parts of the country, and Democrats have tended to, be, to, to uh, accumulate. Um, so there has been some sort of blue state, red state sorting, and that, that has, that's feeds kind of polarization in the population. But it, what, what, what the scholarship has found is that the, the, the polarization in Congress is much more extreme than the polarization in the population. And this is, this is why. Right? I mean, there are other things to redistricting and majority-minority districts and so on, which we could, we could point to. But this is a big part of the story, because what, if, if you have to win a primary in order to get a, a, a elected in, into Congress, and the only way you can win a, a primary is to come out here, you, it means, uh, you know, uh, that you have to to uh, somebody on, pretty far out on the extreme of your party uh, in order to get elected. And so what's happened as the decentralization of control of parties has accelerated, you've got this polarization of Congress, which shows up in all the literature. Um, uh, Poole and Rosenthal and many other people have... Uh, um, Morris Fiorina, they've all found that this polarization of, in the legislature doesn't reflect the polarization in the population. And I, I think my own judgment uh, is that this is a big part of the story. So you get um, more clientelism, you get polarization in the legislature, and the third thing you get, which I think has fed the Trump phenomenon and the Sanders phenomenon, is that the, the people who do get elected lose legitimacy with the people, who, the people who elect them. They're perceived to be frauds and sellouts because in order to win the primaries, they have to go out, they have to go out here. But of course, then come the general election, they, they're trying to win the median voters, so they have to pivot. So they change their positions, they get accused of flip-flopping. Uh, when they get into government, 
And so they're perceived as having sold out and as frauds and as opportunists. Uh, but the system forces them to be that way. And so if you look at all the measures of loss of uh, uh, people often say, um, why is there, um, you have the phenom phenomenon that everybody hates Congress, they hate politicians except for their own politician. But this is part of the story why, because they, 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 um, they find that the politicians are not uh, doing what they, they claimed that they were going to do. Um, so they, got, they lose legitimacy because they can't govern. The U.S. system, for better or for worse, I think for, for worse, mainly depends on a certain amount of cooperation across, across the aisle because it's got all these checks and balances, right? So there are a lot of veto players in the system. And if you, if you can't get cooperation because the politicians are so terrified that if they cooperate, they're going to be killed in a primary in, in, the, next, in the next election cycle. That you, they will go for gridlock because it's the only way that they, they can get reelected. Um, and, and so you get a lot of the phenomena that people are complaining about all as a byproduct uh, in significant part of this, I think, very misguided idea of direct control candidate selection to the parties. Um, now, that's, it's, I think it's particularly egregious in the U.S., but it, it's worth taking a minute to notice that it's not special to the U.S. If you look across the Atlantic to the U.K., some very analogous things have gone on. Uh, this starts in the Labour Party. Um, the, the decades and a half in the wilderness when Thatcher was in charge and, and John Major after her um, produced um, a reform of the system to, to initially to bring much more centralized control by uh, John Smith and, and Neil Kinnock. This was so-called New Labor and eventually Tony Blair who takes it over uh, and uh, uses centralized control uh, to, to create a much more top-down Labor Party, which Gordon Brown, to uh, some extent, is the beneficiary of as well. But after, they, after that, the new Labor story is over and they lose the elections, Ed Miliband comes in. He pushes hard for, it's not primary, but it's a system of direct election of Labor Party leaders um, that has the same effect of ha as having primaries direct elections by the membership. It's a more complicated and nuanced story because part of it was, was sold as actually sort of hurting the power of unions in, in the selection of Democratic of candidates, at which it wasn't very effective. But the, but the idea was to have the membership, again, idea of direct democracy, the members must choose their representatives themselves. This is what democracy is all about. And of course, the question is who is a member? And anybody can pay three pounds to become a member of the Labour Party. So then the question is, well, who can mobilize people to join? And to everybody's astonishment, uh, you, you've got Jeremy Corbyn uh, elected as the, the leader of the Labour Party. Um, and you, you've got now going on in, in the Labour Party the, the same kind of train wreck is just going on in the Republican Party in the U.S. where you know, the parliamentary Labor Party pu passed a vote of no confidence in Jeremy Corbyn by 172 to 40, forced a leadership contest, um, which, which Corbyn is going to win. Um, and, you know, so it's exactly analogous to the situation between the Republican Party leadership and Trump in the Republican Party in the U.S. Um, and obviously that, that is not a way, that, that is just, when this, that pushes this logic to the point of collapse. Um, and if that happens, um, it, I, it's hard for me to see how the Labor Party doesn't split at that point. Um, so the Tories have a milder version of it. There was, there used to be informal selection 
systems of the leader of the Conservative Party. A lot of pressure to democratize that. And eventually they started having parliamentary select, the parliamentary party vote for the, the leadership. Uh, there was pressure to democratize that further. And then so they created their current system, which is the parliamentary party votes until they get it down to two candidates and then it's sent out to the membership uh, for a vote. Now, as it turned out, they, they managed to dodge that only because um, uh, Michael Gov and, and Boris uh, Johnson uh, engaged in, a, in a, a curious kind of mutual suicide pact. But, you know, if the system had operated as it was, is, was designed to operate, Johnson would have gone up against uh, May, uh, and the membership would have picked Johnson, because the membership are, you know, the membership are out here uh, in the Downsian story. So we, we and they, you know, I think the Tories are probably better off with May, who's a lot closer to the median voter in the British polity uh, than Boris Johnson would have been. So they dodged a bullet in, in that sense, but I think for idiosyncratic reasons. Um, in the U.S., come back to the U.S., the Democrat, um, under, they, you know, they saw the bad side of this, this phenomenon very early on because the McGovern-Fraser Commission pushed this decentralization of selection onto them. And what happened? Well, what happened was they got McGovern. And, you know, McGovern was completely wiped out because he was way out here, and it was child's play for Nixon, uh, you know, to, to come over here in the general election. And um, basically, I think what did McGovern, I don't think he even won his home state. Uh, maybe he won one or two states. Um, and so the, the, the Democrats have... Uh, they started to realize uh, that this system was, wasn't working. Uh, and by the way, nor did the introduction of quotas, because the, the, the problem with overrepresenting women and minority groups is that you underrepresent white males. Uh, but if they're the, a big chunk of the electorate, uh, it doesn't help you. So they, they sort of aided and abetted Nixon's Southern strategy of pulling uh, white, the white working class electorate away from the Democratic Party, but that's a, it's a sort of separate topic. But so the antidote to this for the Democrats was the introduction of the system of superdelegates. Uh, and the, the notion of superdelegates is um, that these are people that are essentially going to represent the interests of the par party hierarchy and prevent the emergence of a system in, uh, of what, what the Labour Party is dealing with right now in the UK, where the parliamentary party is at odds with the um, membership, or what the Republicans are right now, with the, the leadership in Congress is at odds with the grassroots of the Republican Party, or the grassroots of the Republican Party that express themselves through the process anyway. Um, and so they have, um, <coughs> About 15% of the delegates are these superdelegates, 712 out of 4,051. Um, are these superdelegates who are um, not bound uh, as the primaries and caucuses dictate? You may think that 15% isn't that much, but, it, but it's a lot because they create momentum and inertia. They create momentum and then inertia for the momentum that they've created because they pledge themselves early. Um, and, and to overcome that, you have to have real counter momentum. So they, and I mean, you know, Obama developed real counter momentum in 2008 and finally managed to pull them away from Hillary Clinton. Um, and, but, it, but it was a very steep decline, and, and most people were very surprised that he was able to do it. it was, he's an unusually effective and charismatic politician, which he is not. Um, but this time around, uh, it worked, uh, basically. Uh, but for the superdelegates, uh, probably Hillary would have ended up using Sanders. Um, I mean, obviously, it's a counterfactual. We, we don't really know, but um, 
he came on as a an ex completely unexpected insurgent in the same way that Corbyn did in the Labour Party. Um, and she wasn't ready for it. And the, the superdelegates created this huge buffer, and it was why Sanders was yelling and screaming all the way through. Um, but, little known Sanders, you know, Hillary has to, has, because, of, because the, the uh, because she's not in a particularly strong position and she's got a, a, such high negatives and so on, she really needs these Sanders voters. Uh, Trump, it, one of Trump's one-liners is that by agreeing to support Hillary, Sanders has made a deal with the devil. He's, now he's calling <coughs> Hillary the devil. But actually, the real deal with the devil is the other way around, because what, that what's much less well known is that in order to get Sanders' support, uh, Hillary has to agree that next time, they, ma they make the rules for the next election um, now, and they've set up a commission, but they've, they've decided already what the commission is going to find. They are going to, bi they are going to bind two-thirds of the superdelegates. To defang the superdelegates of this power, he wanted to get rid of the superdelegates, but so he got a, you know he got two thirds of what he wanted. Um, so in effect, this is going to make a big difference because it's going to mean that the next Bernie Sanders is going to have a much easier time in the Democratic Party. Um, the, you know, it, it won't matter to Hillary because uh, if she's a successful incumbent, she'll be able to withstand it. And if she's not a successful incumbent at the age of 72, she probably won't run. Uh, so um, it's neither here nor there from her point of view. But it's setting up the Democrats for exactly the, same, the kind of problem that Republicans have right now. Because if the Republicans had superdelegates like the Democrats have, um, they, wouldn't be, they wouldn't be stuck with Trump. Right? So... Um, now, the, the Republicans do have superdelegates, um, but they only have a few, about 7%. They, they have 168 superdelegates out of 2,472. And as part of this pressure to democratize the Republican Party, the same pressure, the same idea of demac direct democracy, actually, this year, even the Republican superdelegates uh, have been... Um, bound. So actually the superdelegates are not superdelegates at all because they had to vote uh, to reflect what was agreed at the, in the primaries and caucuses, at least on the first round, if it had come to that. So in effect, they don't have any superdelegates at all in the Republican Party. Um, so uh, here you have the, you know, the Democrats this evidence of what, what can happen, essentially being forced to agree as a condition for getting Sanders to support Hillary to, to do to the Democratic Party what, what the Republicans have done to themselves. Um, so that, that's the real, um, I think that's the real deal that the devil that has been done, not the one that uh, Trump has been talking about. So. Having said this, what is going to be the impact of Trump in light of all of this? Well, um, it's hard, it's hard to, to say anything definitive. If Trump wins, which I think is unlikely, um, given the demographics and given his propensities for own goals, which seems to be about three times her propensity for own goals, um, and so on. Um, if he wins, all bets are off. I think it's, it seems inconceivable that it wouldn't split the Republican Party in some way, shape, or form. So we might be looking at uh, when the, the know-nothings, uh, which were very, they were anti-immigrant, xenophobic party, um, emerged and basically destroyed the Whigs, and it was out of that that Lincoln eventually built the Republican Party. We might be looking at something like that, um, but it's very hard to know. Presumably, 
if he were to win a lot a lot would depend on how, how he governed and whether he could govern uh, and you know uh, what sorts of messes he got into and whether who who extracted him from them but in terms of party politics it's very hard to see how the party would survive assuming he loses which as I say is I think more likely it still might split the party um, because uh, I think uh, very big and powerful group of the Republican establishment who is going to want to change the rules and get rid of this uh, and and create something just you know just as the Democrats are getting rid of the superdelegates the Republicans are going to create them uh, uh, it, it will be the only way that they can prevent complete disintegration of the party um, so I think they're going to go back to a, a much more centralized system. Um, well, what can we conclude then from all of this? Um, well, one, one, one observation is that reformers are always fighting the last war. Um, that, you know, uh, and, and it's in some way rather depressing that they're always for, fight, fighting the last war. But, but there it is. That's in the nature of politics. But I think, the, the, you know, the, the other conclusion I would, uh, what I would uh, emphasize is we, tr we should try and get beyond just fighting the last war and think about what's a good idea. And um, decentralized, decentralized selection of candidates for party for political office is really a bad idea. It's a very, it's a deeply misguided conception of democracy. Um, it's, it, it's misguided for a number of reasons. One is that uh, as w what, the, what makes democracy work is inter-party competition and for the reasons I've already talked about, intra-competition is not good. Uh, but this is all about intra-party intra competition trumping to mix, uh, to, to, not the right term in, the, in this context perhaps, but intra-party competition is trumping and overshadowing inter-party competition. Uh, and, and it means that, you know, the more you have this system, the only, since the vast majority of seats in, in the U.S. system are safe seats, it means that the only meaningful competition you have is the primary competition or the caucus competition. And then it's all over. Uh, so like in Connecticut, the Democrats win everything all, where I come from. The Democrats win everything all the time. The only thing that matters is the primaries. Uh, so it's only intra-party competition. Um, that produces all the governance problems I've already talked about. Um, it produces clientelism. Um, and it produces leaderships that can't focus on what you would think the leadership of a political party should focus on, which is the long-term interests of the party, um, because they, can't, they are so hobbled um, by the fact that, you know, even Paul Ryan now, the Speaker of the House, is facing a primary challenge in Wisconsin with Trump supporting his challenger. Um, you know, and so you, you have the, 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 poss the possibility that Paul Ryan or anybody can pursue what would be a sensible strategy for the Republican Party becomes impossible uh, to deliver on. And so, uh, just one final point um, is that, that you really have to think about what is a political Because the Schumpeterian story sort of models the polity on the economy and so the, you know, parties are the analogs of firms, and voters are the analogs of consumers, and votes are the analogs of profits, and policies are the analogs of goods and services, and democratic accountability is sort of an analog of consumer sovereignty. And that all works up to a point. Uh, but like all analogies, eventually it starts to break down, because the, where the point at which it breaks down is that no analog shareholders for political parties. Um, and the idea that it's the membership uh, 
produces all these this patho pathological uh, outcomes that we're talking about because um, you don't have to pay any real cost um, a member. In Britain, you pay three pounds and you can determine the outcome. Uh, so it's a very um, awkward analogy. And so the, the political parties are not like firms at the end of the day in that there's no residual claimant. The, uh, uh, the only other institution that is like that, that I've, I've, I've been able to think of, is actually private elite university in the U.S. It's that if, if we took all of Yale's assets and sold them, it's not clear who would be entitled to the residual claim, right? There are no shareholders. And so, so you know, one of the things you see in universities is that everybody, all the different interest or patron groups of universities think that they are the ones who should be the uh, custodians of the future. The students think it should be them, the faculty think it should be them, the administrators think it should be them, because there isn't an equivalent. The, the, the corporation thinks it be, there isn't a, an equivalent of shareholders. And I think exactly the same thing is true of political parties, that um, there's no equivalent of shareholders. Uh, and, the, and so you get this kind of constant battling and wrestling for who are the real interest and all every different all these different groups will you know the the leadership think it's them the the uh, membership thinks it's them uh, and various other groups that try and influence political parties think it should be them um, but in the long run I think you have to ask yourself the question what do we order to answer that question as to where you should put the power to select candidates. And the answer to that is, I think Schumpeter was basically right, what we want political parties to do is to compete over public philosophies, um, not engage in clientelism uh, and not engage in uh, forms of competition that are going to be antithetical to um, uh, presenting voters uh, with a competition over governing philosophy. So, though, for those reasons, uh, I think that the, the answer lies in uh, setting up systems of cent more centralized control that are going to force parties and party leaderships to compete for the median voter in the polity. So why don't I stop there, and you can all tell me why I'm wrong. <laughs>